Before we begin today's video, take a look at this man copying the digit that he's seeing on the screen in front of him. As you notice, something seems to be severely at fault here, because according to this man, this is how he perceives the digit 8, or rather how he doesn't perceive anything but a meaningless scramble of lines. So what's happening here? In 2011, that man was diagnosed with a rare degenerative brain disorder called corticobasal syndrome, a rare disease that may cause you to have poor coordination, stiffness, difficulty thinking, trouble with speech or language or other problems. And one of the most striking consequences for this man in particular is that he can't perceive numbers from 2 to 9. 0 and 1, he can perceive just fine, he can also do math. But presented on the paper, the digits don't make any sense to him. Which begs the question, how could you perceive simple digits in such a bizarre way? Bizarre perceptual events go often in hand with different kinds of blood supply shortages to our brain, such as in strokes or dementia. Some time ago, this AI-generated picture surfaced the web, strikingly photorealistic for the fact that all the objects in it are practically undefinable. Many viewers reported the image to represent their experience of having a stroke, particularly in the occipital lobe of the cerebral cortex, which is associated with visual perception. Although everything looks hauntingly familiar, you cease to recognize anything. What used to be made up of meaningful holes, now disperses into an alien mess of visual data. The point is that the world plays an interpretative role in the way we see the world around us. In the rare cases where the brain fails to synthesize the objects around us into sound defined and meaningful objects with, me with meaning, yeah, <laughs> that's where we see um, just how important the thing that the brain was doing before really is. The world that we see is not the world as it is, but it's the world as our brain interprets it for us. Nowhere is this more apparent than in the phenomena of visual illusions, images that are designed in such a way to mess with the patterns that our brain is imposing onto the world. Of course, illusions don't have to be visual. We now know auditory illusions and illusions that stem from the vestibular system and result in spatial disorientation. There's also proprioceptive illusions such as phantom limbs, clearly showing that our brain is constructing a body image for us that is independent from our actual bodily constitution. One hint about the nature of the perceived world came already from the 19th century, the so-called reverse goggles experiment made by George Stratton. So basically what he did is he presented his participants with special goggles that turned the world around. So basically what they saw is an image of whatever they see around themselves, but mirrored into the wrong direction, upside down. And although that was very disorienting at first, the strange thing is that after they were wearing these glasses for quite some time, their brain just reversed that effect and when, while they were wearing the goggles, they saw the world as being uh, turned the right way. Their brain just saw through the effect of the goggles and decided to reverse the image once more. That's also the reason why I can watch TV lying on my side. I see an image that is slanted 90 degrees, but my brain just connects that image so that I can see a straight, uh, meaningful uh, scene. Early 20th century science, namely the behavioristic science, inspired by thinkers such as Ivan Paolo, yes, the guy who came up with Paolo's bell, held a fairly common sense view of nature. It is consisting of objects and then light hits those objects and that light deflects into your eyes and gets projected on your uh, retina and then what your brain does basically it presents the projection to your consciousness and that's it. So in this view basically what we see is the literal projection of the world around us. We see the world as it is reflected to our eyes. We see things in that sense just as they are. But already then this picture got contested by some thinkers of that time and they 
said that no, the world as we see is not just our brain passively accepting information, but rather our brain is actively transforming and reinterpreting the world around us. The most exemplary thinkers that wanted to put forth a new understanding of perception from these insights were the so-called Gestalt psychologists, Max Wertheimer, Kurt Kofka and Wolfgang Köhler. Gestalt is a German word for form or shape, but can also mean a pattern or configuration of things. What they argued for is that the perceived world is not a faithful projection of space, but rather our perceptual field is being configured, transformed into a Gestalt, a meaningful whole, a pattern, a configuration, a shape of visual stimuli. Looking at the world is always preceded by a spontaneous organization of the sensory field. Take the Müller Lyre illusion for example. It's composed of two parallel lines that are of the same length, but because of the context that they are given in, our brain presents one as being bigger than the other one. In Oliver Sacks' book, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, Sacks describes a case study of one of his patients who has visual agnosia, a neurological condition that leaves him unable to recognize faces and objects. The problem is that his brain fails to form gestalts for faces. What we see as meaningful configuration of visual stimuli is just an alien mess for the patient, not unlike the patient we mentioned in the beginning, who saw nothing meaningful in the digit 8. Nowadays, if you'll search for gestalt psychology, what you'll find first will be the application of their insights to design, namely understanding the gestalt principles make for a pleasant visual composition. Which is a pity that that's what we pay attention to, given just how significant their insights really were for 20th century thought. Some thinkers, such as the renowned French phenomenologist Maurice Jean-Jacques Merleau-Ponty, argued that accepting the insights of Gestalt psychology changes everything about how we think about investigating the world, and might present just the most radical revolution in science and philosophy. Synthesizing and reworking the insights of Gestalt theory, Merleau-Ponty proposed an original understanding of the relationship between consciousness and nature, which led him to views which are similar to the monumental work being and time by Martin Heidegger, although Merleau-Ponty's views turned out to be much more fruitful for the 21st century cognitive sciences, which is also why his ideas are currently enjoying a renaissance. The gist is that while the realism of natural sciences and empirical psychology wrongly assume that when we talk about nature we're talking about things that are independent from our consciousness, since our view of nature is always a configured and transformed phenomena, it's also wrong to reduce nature to a mere product of consciousness, such as seen in the idealism of Immanuel Kant. The world in this view is not created by our consciousness, but emerges from an intimate interplay between consciousness and nature. The world that we see is not the world as it is, but it's also not the world created for us by the brain. It's a realm that springs forth from consciousness trying to make the world into a meaningful and homely environment. That's it for this video. Thank you for watching. I will uh, in the future try to make more videos like these where I will just, you know, get a topic that I'm interested in, uh, pose a question to myself and then do my best to uh, arrive at some plausible answer to that using uh, well, using the knowledge uh, that various thinkers provided us with. Yeah, thank you for watching.